son, you guys did a great job. Thank you. Uh, this uh, weekend, we, of course, celebrate uh, Memorial Day. And so this is a day in which uh, we recognize and honor those uh, who have given their lives for this country, those who have laid their lives down in service for this country. And what I'd like to do this morning, if you have a family member or are connected to someone, um, either through a, a close family friend or friendship or maybe it's somebody uh, from your past that has given their lives, uh, we would like to pray for them this morning. And so this weekend, uh, if you've lost anyone, uh, whether it be through service or not, um, kindly raise your hands and we'll be praying for you. See that hand? Jesus uh, tells us in, in the Gospel of John, uh, he says this, Most assuredly I say to you, He who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into the judgment, but has passed from death to life. When we believe in Jesus and confess him as Lord with our mouths and, and have faith in him, we pass through death. We pass through death and we know that death is not the final conclusion for those who belong to Christ Jesus. We receive what eternal life. And not only is that life which begins after we pass on from this reality into the next, but that eternal life, we can pull it forward into our current experiences here today. What is eternal life? Eternal life is peace and joy liberty, freedom, being set free from all of those things which have so easily beset us in the past. We all have a choice this morning. As we remember those who have gave up their lives and as we honor those who have given their lives for this country, as we look back and reflect and possibly grieve over those that we've lost, we are surrounded by, supported by, guarded within the reality that God does not lose anybody. He holds us together just like uh, he, he holds those dear saints that have passed on before us together. He holds us together this morning. And so whatever this week has been to you, whether it's been a week of loss or of celebration or exploration, you have found your way here this morning into God's house. And he receives us freely. And so this morning we are invited to turn away from our own way of doing things, our own paradigms, and to receive through faith his grace, his spirit, his love, and eternal life. Saints, we're going to pass through death, but we're not going to stay there. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you so much for this day. Lord, we love you. We praise you, Lord. And we are coming here uh, at the throne of grace this morning, Lord. And we pray that you would pour out your spirit freely upon us, Lord Jesus. Guard our hearts, open our eyes, open our ears, Lord. Just allow a celebratory praise to be lifted up in this place. This morning, Lord, we thank you for the joyful noise that we uh, are going to hear and participate in. And Lord, fill our hearts with such joy right now. Lord, joy that's unstoppable, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, that you are the Prince of Peace. And Lord, for us in this moment, we say strip us away of everything that does not resemble you. In our lives, Lord, empty us out of sin. Empty us out of pride and, and lust and selfishness, Lord. And this, the sense and the need to control everything. Lord, we lay that down. We walk away from that need and those desires. And we turn to you this morning, the author and the finisher of our faith. We love you, Lord. We pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen and amen. We stand across this sanctuary and let's worship Jesus this morning.
chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my You'll have to forgive my sniffles and my, my hoarse voice this morning. A head cold or something's found its way to me. But so blessed to have Mitchell back. Um, such a blessing to the worship service. And then Seth this morning on trombone. That was awesome. So, yes, give them a hand. And just uh, so blessed to have them, them with us this morning. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to great salvation it's so full and so free everybody sing oh how i love and oh how i love jesus oh Jesus, 
Jesus, there's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Away, but there's just something about that name. Tell him one more time. Oh, how you love him. Sing, oh, how I love Jesus. Jesus, we love you, we thank you. Lord, you mean everything to us. Lord, we thank you for uh, your strength and your power, Lord, and, and the deliverance that you have accomplished in our lives. Lord, we thank you for uh, what you have taught us, Lord Jesus, and shown to us. But Lord Jesus, most of all, we thank you for gifting us with your very spirit, Lord, for gifting us with tremendous supernatural heavenly peace, Lord. For giving us joy which is uh, unstoppable and, and unspeakable, Lord. We thank you for reaching down way below the bottom to, to rescue us and to set us upon a firm foundation, Lord. We thank you for shaking things from our lives which do not belong, Lord, even though it may be painful, it is at the same time beautiful, Lord. We thank you for filling us with your life, Lord, for changing the way that we think, the way, Lord, that we understand life, Lord, and for being right here with us, intertwined to us, Lord, connected by and through your heart, Lord, connecting us not only to you, but to one another. And so, Lord Jesus, here this morning, Father, my prayer is that you would anoint me to preach this message exactly as you would have it preached this morning. Lord, allow me and empower me to say nothing more and nothing less other than what you would have shared and spoken to us, your people, here this morning. Lord, we pray these things. In your name, amen and amen. As you're turning in your Bibles to uh, the book of Mark, I, I want to say again, as Amanda has said it, didn't you guys enjoy music and worship this morning? Thank you, Mitchell, uh, Seth, and Amanda. I'm also happy to report that you guys now have two doctors in the house, and so uh, Dr. Begley and his wife, Lucretia, it's an honor to have you guys here as well. I don't want to leave anybody out. Is there a third doctor or fourth doctor? Amanda, let's give Amanda a hand. Uh, <laughs> love it. So this is the second week in our series, The Mind of Christ. We're really going to be going a lot of places through this series. It's going to be really neat, really profound. We're going to look at uh, about ourselves, learn about ourselves, how we think and how that gets us in trouble 
And then we're going to look at Jesus and how he thinks, and that's how uh, we should be living. So over the next several weeks, we're going to be exploring that. Today is kind of part two of the introduction, but uh, we'll dive right in here to Mark chapter 8. Uh, we'll begin at verse 27. Now Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of uh, Caesarea Philippi. And on the road he asked his disciples, saying to them, Who do men say that I am? So they answered, John the Baptist. But some say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, You are the Christ. Then he strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him. Verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and, and be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke this word openly, but Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Peter begins to rebuke Jesus. Total mistake. Verse 33. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. I'll say it again. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. I recently heard a story about a, a young, rich banker, and I think this was on the West Coast. He was driving out one night, and it was storming. The rain was coming down. It was windy. Uh, and he had a pretty nice BMW, and he was driving along, and, and the road unfortunately became slick due to the rain, and, and the banker uh, lost control of his car, and so it started spinning. Uh, and it was approaching a cliff, and, and the car was about to go off of the cliff, and, and the banker, being real frantic, trying to save his life, he, he unbuckled his seatbelt and, and jumped from the car as the car plummeted down into the sea. Banker escaped with his life, but he lost his arm at the shoulder. And so the banker climbed up on a rock and sat in there, and he just kept saying, My BMW, my BMW, my BMW, my BMW. Well, a trucker passes by. A trucker pulls over, Terry, and he stops, and he gets out, and he sees the banker, and he sees what he's saying. He's saying, my BMW, my BMW. And the trucker says, man, you got a lot bigger problems than your BMW. He said, look down at your arm. The banker looks down says, my Rolex, my Rolex, my Rolex. You see, being carnal-minded will get us to focus on the wrong things in life. Being carnally-minded will get us to focus on those things which often are fleeting and, and have no eternal significance or uh, eternal value, right? And, and so this banker obviously did not have the mind of Christ. He did not, he was thinking about himself, he was thinking about his possessions and not upon spiritual things, of course, like Jesus uh, would lead us into. To think like Christ, we've got to do three things. We first got to know who God is, second, we've got to know who we are, and third, we've got to allow the power of the Holy Spirit to transform us. This isn't a 10 step guide to receiving the mind of Christ, an ABC 123 list that if you apply it practically, then it happens because there's something about having the mind of Christ that is only accessible through faith, through repentance and faith, and through the power of the very Spirit of God. And when we do these things, Right? When we allow the Holy Spirit to transform us, our thoughts change, our emotions change, our psychological responses and understandings change, we are sanctified, growing more into the image of Jesus day by day. And this last verse we read here uh, surmises the entire book of Mark. 
If you study Mark and you see the progression of, of what the disciples are going to, like, like they're always looking to guard their own power. They're, they're, they're worried that other people are casting out demons and devils. And then they're worried when they can't do it themselves. And so they're totally consumed by their own lives, by their self-interest. But Mark says this, basically, you don't think like God thinks. You don't think like God thinks. And so that's what we're going to be doing here this morning. And for the remainder of uh, this series, we're going to look at how do we think like Jesus Christ. It's like the children of Israel as they enter the promised land. They assess the land. Some are filled with fear. But you can't get there by thinking right or behaving right. It's got to be God's very spirit that leads us into the promised land of faith and fulfillment. What I'm talking about is we have barriers. The Bible calls it the flesh, which prevent us from fully living within and abiding within Jesus Christ because while we abide with him, we're filled with distractions. We're filled with distractions. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. And we're, we're in Him. We're united. When we confess that He is our Lord and Savior and believe in our hearts, we belong to Him, right? And, and Paul says that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Neither height, nor depth, nor angel, nor demon. No affliction or anything will be able to separate us from the love of God. But while we are here on earth, he is teaching us how to depend upon Him. Day by day, He is teaching us how to lean on His understanding and not our own. Because when we lead on our own understanding, we mess things up. And so we see here the carnal mind versus the mind of Christ. And, and maybe perhaps some of you feel like sometimes there, there's a war raging within you. Or maybe, maybe not so much a full out war. Maybe it's a whisperings of a coup that's going on. Maybe there's some unsettling within your spirit to where like one time or one day or one moment, part of the day, you love Jesus, right? You're going to serve Him. You're going to lay your life down. You're going to go down to, to the food pantry and, and give away food. You're going to go to the church and, and pray for hours upon end. But then other times you just kind of feel like maybe sitting home and watching Dukes of Hazard. Or, or maybe sometimes you see when somebody has done you wrong and you want to take up vengeance quickly. Talking about two minds that exist around us. Talking about, now I'm not talking about just uh, uh, the biological brain. Of course it includes that, but it's something a little more thorough. A little deeper than that. Talking about living in the spirit uh, or the mind of Christ versus the carnal mind. What are we going to do, right? What are we going uh, to live in, right? And, and so we've got this division. And here's the thing. If we live with a divided allegiance, right? If we try to keep a foot in both, on both sides, it's going to be a living hell. It's going to be a living hell because we can't serve two masters, right? We can only serve one. And so there's two ways to serve God. We can either do it in our own strength or we can do it by His strength, right? If we try to do it on our own, we're going to mess things up. Look at Abram, right? In the Old Testament, God had given him a promise. Uh, but after 10 years of being married uh, with Sarah, after the promise, he got impatient. And he takes upon himself Hagar, right? A concubine. And they have a child, it's Ishmael. And to this day, there's contention and conflict war between the offspring of Abraham and Sarah, Isaac, Israel, and uh, Ishmael, right? And so through, through thinking, Abraham tried to think his way through this. It didn't work out well for him. So in order to live in the Spirit, we have to abide in the Spirit. We have to abide in Christ. We cannot obtain the mind of Christ in our own power. We can't do it. We try to think our way into it. We try to behave our way into it. But because they're both built upon human strength, they're both destined to fail. 
So what are we going to do? If we can't think our way into the mind of Christ, if we can't behave our way into the mind of Christ, how in the world are we going to get the mind of Christ? You see, it comes by Spirit. It comes by the power of the blood. It comes by, uh, Jesus says when he's talking to Nicodemus, it's like the wind. You can't really tell where it's coming from or where it's going. Talking about the mind of Christ. Talking about a supernatural uh, progression here. Talking about a supernatural habitation. A co-laboring with us and the Holy Spirit. If you have your Bibles, turn to, to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Look down uh, at verse 6. We're going to go down to verse 6 real quickly uh, here. Romans 8 verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Uh, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Why do we die if we have carnal minds? If we set our minds on the things of this flesh, why do we die? Because we're apart from God. It's only through God that all things are held together, through God that, that we can live. It's through His, uh, through the life and the Spirit, having the mind of Jesus, that we are filled with life. But when we're carnally minded, it always uh, lands upon or into death, right? And this is talking about our everyday thought patterns and our behavior, right? Because when we're filled with the Spirit, then our thoughts will align. Our behavior uh, will align with uh, God's will, right? And so to be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be carnally minded is death. Look at verse 8 in Romans chapter 8. It says this, So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So, so if we're consumed by the things of our life, if we're, if we're consumed about BMWs, if we're consumed about Rolexes, if we're, if we're consumed about whether or not our right opinion has been heard and validated, if we are consumed with the fact that we have always got to defend our cause, that we've always got to defend our reputation, if we are consumed with the fact that we can absolutely make God relative and subjective, that we can interpret God's nature and apply it and to our own level of comfort, then we will die. Because God is sovereign. God is gracious. And God gives us His Spirit which leads us in to all truth. Look at verse 13 of Romans chapter 8. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And finally, back up in verse 2 of Romans 8. We're just laying the groundwork here this morning. Verse 2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Live in the Spirit, it's life. Live in the flesh, it's death. Can you be saved and still be carnally minded? Can you, can you be saved and still be carnally minded? Remember, Scripture talks about this quite often, right? Paul says, I, I, I do what I don't want to do and I don't do what I want to do. There is this, this conflict within, right? And so as we give ourselves over more and more to the habitation, the indwelling and the filling of the Holy Spirit, the more of the mind of Christ we will have, right? God grafts us in, right? We receive salvation, but too often, too many times, we're still focused on carnal things. And these carnal things are not necessarily sinful. It's when we get them out of order. They become disordered. They become disprioritized or unprioritized or misaligned, so to speak. So as saints, we want to know how to live in the Spirit. Here's the thing. A lot of us don't. If I'm just being honest, and I'm talking about myself. If we're just being honest, a lot of times we don't live in the Spirit. We don't seek the welfare of others often enough. We don't love... God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. 
Instead, we want to spot differences between others. We want to pin down on some uh, secondary, tertiary theological point and cause division when the mind of Jesus Christ says, says look, come unto me, right? That he does, he does uh, the guiding, the leading, the saving, the rescuing. He does the progression and the sanctification, right? But we want to control everything. We want to be gatekeepers. We want to be gatekeepers and, and we, want to, we, we want to objectify others. And we want, well, not only are we damaging others, we're hurting ourselves, right? This is about how do we live, how do we live and let go, let go of the things in this life which we need to let go of. Because if we hold on to it too closely, too tightly as it goes down and sinks. If we're not careful, we'll sink with it. Talking about moving through life with the mind of Christ, not holding anything too tightly other than Him and those around us. So how do we live with the mind of Jesus Christ? We need to have our, our hearts cleansed from double-mindedness and we need for God to make us holy. Because we are holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, we are holy His. Uh, I don't know if many of you guys have heard of uh, Albert Orsburn. He was uh, an early leader in the Salvation Army. And things were going good for Albert and, and his crew. And, and one day his supervisor came along and, and said, Look, Albert, what we're going to do, we're going to take your entire district and we're going to kind of re reprogram it. We're going to re-separate it. We're going to redraw it, remap it. Well, Albert, up until then, God was moving in a mighty way there in that camp. Like people were getting healed and people were getting saved. And God was doing some great and mighty things. But when they told Albert this, he knew that the division within his district would cause a disruption to what God was doing, or so he thought. So Albert begins to defend himself. He, he begins to criticize his supervisors. He begins to get calloused and his, his heart begins to kind of grow cold and, and he drifts. He drifts. I wonder if any of us here this morning are drifting. We, we, we give lip service that we're Christians and, and we, we're at church every week. We, uh, we pray and we read at least 10 minutes a day. But when things don't go well, when things don't go right, instead of responding in the mind of Christ and in the spirit of Christ, we begin to get self-absorbed. And when we get self-absorbed, we isolate. Until before long, we've drifted, drifted, drifted away. Albert would get in a car wreck. He got in a car wreck and got put in the hospital. And while he was in the hospital, he was laying there in his bed. This is how the story goes. And he heard a young man next to him singing. Singing a hymn. And Albert began to feel his heart warm. Kind of like John Wesley, he said he began to feel his heart warmed again and, and that he felt God's Spirit again in, in his life. And, and the Spirit of God was reawakened in his life. He realized the mistake that he made, that, that like he needed to defend himself and that God could not move when, when man got in the way, right? And so Albert repented of that and then he turned to Christ again. His heart was filled with his glory, right? With his love and with his peace patience and understanding. And Albert Osborne wrote this hymn, Savior, if my feet have faltered. This is what one of those choruses state. Savior, if my feet have faltered on the pathway of the cross, if my purposes have altered or my gold mixed with dross, forbid me not thy service. Keep me in thy employ. Pass through me a good cleansing, so I may but give thee joy. Saints, I wonder if some of us have drifted in, in maybe not so apparent ways. Maybe nobody sitting around you right now realizes it. But you've drifted in your heart. 
You, you, you once loved Jesus with like everything, but, but for some reason now there's like a complacency there. there there's a detachment there. there. There, What used to warm you and move you and, and move you to tears, now you just observe and you're unaffected. If that's you this morning, we've got to ask ourselves, are we thinking on the things of this world or are we thinking upon the things of Jesus Christ? Are we allowing the Spirit of God to move through us, right? And it's not a beautiful three-point sermon that's going to change you. It's not hearing uh, our worship team sing a song that, that's going to change you. It's going to be the very Spirit of God that changes you. And He's inviting you back this morning. He's calling out. He's saying, I see your distance. I see your detachment. But you're not too far gone from me. You're not too far gone from me. And he extends his arm and his hand to you and his spirit to you. And he is drawing you closer back to him, to home. Because that's where we really belong. We're not citizens so much of this world or this country. We are citizens of heaven. And Jesus is calling us home this morning. So the question is, are we going to be spiritually minded or carnally minded. Carnally minded is being driven by desires, and the mind of Christ is driven by what pleases God. And so finally here this morning, what does it mean to live with a mind like Jesus? What does it mean to live with a mind like Jesus? So you're, you're going to have several dimensions or attributes of what that looks like, but first is, is this. You're going to have a desire to see all people saved. Uh, you're going to, your heart is going to align with the mission of God, with the heart of Jesus, right? Which desires uh, that no man be lost, desires that all would be saved. And so what does this look like for us when we're out and about in the community, right? And somebody cuts us off in traffic, we ought to pray for them. Not that they're not saved, but our response is going to say a lot about if we're spiritually minded or, or carnally minded, right? As you're watching maybe a, 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 some sports games, games, maybe pray for the opposing team. I don't know, that's crazy, but try it someday, right? Pray for those who, who, who you think may be so far gone that they don't have a prayer, but as long as there's breath in their body, they do. To have the mind of Christ is to see all saved. To have the mind of Christ is to not judge based upon appearance. Only God can see the heart. We don't judge. We inform. We share. We teach. We preach, right? Having the mind of Jesus will seek the salvation of others. Also, having the mind of Jesus will fill you with a compassionate heart. With a compassionate heart. It fills you with love and compassion which pulls you out of that rut of callousness. It pulls you out of that rut of having a grudge, out of bitterness. And I know, folks, that a lot of us in our whole lives, we've suffered some injustice. Some people have done some things wrong to us. They've whispered about us. They've connived about us. They've put into action some plans which are malicious and wicked. Yet here we are, right? The Redeemed, right? Why are we here? Not because of our own power or our own goodness, but it is the very Spirit of God that preserves us, that has brought us through that affliction and established us within His very heart. And so through that, right, through that laying down of unforgiveness and bitterness, the result is the love of Jesus just flowing through us. The love of Jesus filling our hearts and our minds with love for others, for those who are dejected and lost, uh, having compassion for who God has compassion upon, and it's all, right? And so you're going to have this compassionate heart. You're going to want others to be saved, to be liberated uh, through the truth. And, and you're also going to have a heart of humility and obedience, right? You're going to be humble. You're going to be thinking of others more than yourself. You're going to be obedient to the point of following the teachings of Jesus and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. This is life. 
This is the life. This is what living the Christian life is about. It's, it's about depending fully upon God, right? It's about having a heart of humility and obedience. It's about having a heart of love and compassion. It's about having a desire to see all others uh, saved and rescued and healed. May they be doing well as you pray for them. And so, finally, how do we get there? Earlier I said there's not a three-step process. It's not through word or deed that we obtain the mind of Christ. Rather, it is through a pure, gracious outpouring of His Spirit. There's a difference between prayer and meditation. In my own journey over the probably the past year, I've really kind of, uh, my prayer life has changed. For me, I would always pray, I always thought, I'm going to admit this, I know nobody else has done this ever, but I used to tell God how he should run my life. God, if you get me out of this spot by doing this, then that'll be good and we can live happily ever after. But our ways are not like God. Remember, Mark, his whole point is you don't think like God thinks. And so prayer is about more so when we go to the prayer closet, the prayer room, and we've got this list of ideas and repetitions that, or petitions, I'm sorry, petitions that we put before God and asking Him to meet those. That's fine. It's perfectly appropriate. But we've also got to have balance in our lives to where we shut up and listen to Him. It's kind of what? Meditation is. Meditation is prayer, but it's us being silent for a moment to listen to the Holy Spirit, to receive what the Spirit is saying. You want to have the mind of Christ? Well, pray for the mind of Christ. What will happen is He'll empty you out. He'll shake you of everything carnal. It's not fun. It may be a little painful, but it's good and it's worth it. And then when he shakes you of all these carnal things, these, these needs, right, to always be right, this need to escape, this need to always feel good, right? All of these are surface level things. They're all carnal things. When we recognize them, confess them, and lay before the Lord, say, God, take it away. He'll do so. And then he fills us with his spirit. And it's during those times, the most precious times for me recently have been just sitting there thinking about Jesus, beholding the cross, picturing him on the cross and, and walking out of an empty tomb and just sitting there abiding, communing with Jesus. That's the pathway. It's by his spirit, by his power that we receive the mind of Jesus. I'd like to ask our musicians, if you would please, to come uh, back up to the stage as we prepare for our final song this morning, a final time of worship. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 through 12 say this. But God has revealed to us through His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him. That's saying we know uh, ourselves by the spirit within us. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. No one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. No one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received. This is you. This is you. When you believe in Jesus, this is talking about you. This is the Word of God going to you this very moment. And it says this, Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now you have received, not the Spirit of the world, not the Spirit of the world which says, Get what you can before you get out of here. Get all those BMWs and Rolexes and climb the political tower to get what you can to make your mark on this world because all it's about anyway is wealth and possessions and status and degrees and acclamations. That's the spirit of the world, folks. Don't listen to it. 
but the Spirit who is from God. From God. That we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Do you see that? Can you see our Creator here giving us, freely giving us things that, that we can access through what? Is it through trying harder? Is it through thinking correctly on everything? No. We receive it because God sends it to us and gives it to us. You see, to have the mind of Christ is about submission. We lay it all down for his glory, for his kingdom, for his purpose. And here this morning, the eyes of Jesus are searching. He knows your heart. He knows your thoughts. He knows your failures and your weaknesses and your strength. And he's inviting you this morning to receive his spirit, his mind, which is life, which is peace, which is joy. And so this morning... I'd like to invite you as we prepare to, to move into our final part of service here this morning. If there's any area in your life that, that, that you've been kind of holding back to, you, you've been giving God like 75, 80%, right? But there's this one part, this, this one neighbor did you wrong and you can't quite get it out of your mind. Your, your, your family member has done you so wrong and, and you're going to give God 90%, but my goodness, holding on to this hurt sure does feel good if we're being honest. You want the mind of Christ? Lay that down. Lay down the need to always be right. Just lean on Jesus and receive His Spirit, His mind, His heart. His heart. Would you please bow your heads and pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for this day, Lord. We thank you for your life, for your spirit, for your, your mind that you give us. And Lord Jesus, here this morning, Father, our prayer is that you would empty us of ourselves, Lord, that, that you would allow the lies that we bought into to just melt away, to crumble away, Lord, the sin of offense that we have committed against others and that we have received and committed towards others, Lord. We repent of that, uh, dissolve those offenses from within our hearts this morning, Lord Jesus. Lord, allow us to not give in to the spirit of this world which seeks violence, which seeks uh, retribution, but Lord, uh, captivate us and capture us by your very spirit, which freely gives of our lives, Lord, just as you gave your life upon the cross, Jesus. You are the author and the finisher of our faith, Lord. Allow us to lay hold, allow us to catch a glimpse of that love, to catch a glimpse of your beauty, of your holiness, Lord, with your arms stretched wide, Lord Jesus, and your blood falling, Lord, not only to the ground, but into those realms and those spaces which defeats the power of the enemy, which defeats sin, the power of sin. It atones for and forgives uh, the guilty, Lord, and you make us righteous through your provision, through your sacrifice, through your love, Lord Jesus. And we don't want to just stop right there. We want more, Lord. Consume our minds, our thoughts, everything about us, Lord Jesus. Empty us of ourselves, Lord, and fill us with you more and more. pray these things in your name. Amen and amen. Once you guys stand up across the sanctuary, if you need prayer this